Good to be back with you all again today. I cannot believe with all my decisions, desires to show off the church that one of my favorite places of, of our church I haven't used yet for an opportunity to, to do some talking about the Psalms. And so today, with this beautiful Psalm that we're going to be looking at, the 100th Psalm, which is a continuation of a, of a section we are, I'm going to talk more about, but maybe one of, uh, after the 23rd Psalm, one of the best known Psalms, but not for the reasons you may think, um, in that it, it is a Psalm that we know that's used for worship. It's in this collection that I'm finding I enjoy so much, then this fourth book that we've talked about in the Psalms, this collection of of Psalms, the 96th, 97th, the 98th, 100th, that it's kind of concluding today with um, uh, the, these these songs of high worship and invitations into, to come into God's presence, to recognize that, to proclaim that, to sing that. And, and, and I think the reason I'm enjoying these psalms so much is a part of what I enjoy most about the psalms is when they invite us into worship and into the reflection of who we are in God's grace. And then... Uh, are used in the, the singing of and the thankful praise of. And you're going to see that today. And um, probably already in the back of your head, you're hearing, wait, 100th Psalm. In that, yes, it's the uh, name that we give to a, a collection of tunes, the Old Hundredth, which was based on this psalm in the Psalter. And, and I'm going to use that to close our thing today, our prayer today. I invite you to stay around long enough. I'll have some music. And the words of the old hundredth hymn uh, with the tune that we know more frequently used is our doxology. Um, but has that same connotation of praise and so forth that, that, that is a part of what we are. But again, conscious that I like to get in and talking about this, that I want to open us up in prayer. Uh, and then I'll do the reading of the Psalms and the New American and the Eugene Peterson's message provide maybe just a little bit of background and some some ideas something for us to think about it's a very short song uh, that invites us into great reflection so with that in mind let me start and i'll pray oh god i, I i'm excited i'm captured out here, gathered out here in in this beautiful courtyard that uh, folks especially bill wisnett whom we've celebrated has been a part of creating and keeping this up for others to enjoy giving you thanks for the beauty that is contained here that invites us into recognizing you in creation, recognizing your goodness and your beauty, but more your invitation into life with you. So gather with us, bless us with the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that these become just more than words that we read. But perhaps by the gift of your Spirit are used to transform us more and more into the image of Christ, so that we might worship not only well, but eternally. Praying this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So here we go. The 100th Psalm. Reading from the New American Standard. Uh, they've titled it, All Men or All People Exhorted to Praise God. Taking, that's not from the Masoretic text or the Hebrew text or the, the, the Greek translations, <coughs> but just an English idea of, in the Hebrew text, we have, though, and, and, and the only reason I'm calling this to our attention, I'm going to address it a little bit later, a psalm of thanksgiving. And it writes, Shout joyful to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. I'm going to pause for a minute. Just re remember this. I'm going to come back to it in the New American Standard and in part of the King James also, that translation, that verse 3, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. And I'm going to make a point about this in the Peterson translation as well. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Five short verses. Lots of invitation. Lots of uh, energy. Lots of movement. 
that I'll talk about more. But here now again, and remember here uh, that third uh, the third verse in, in the difference I'll, I'll make the point of from Eugene Peterson. And I love what he says. And he says it's again from the Masoretic text, a Thanksgiving song. And then he says, on your feet now, applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter. Sing yourselves into his presence. And here's that, uh, not controversial, but we'll talk about translation issues. Verse, he says, know this, God is God. And God, God, he made us. We didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. So the, the first thing I'm just going to draw to our attention is that, that that Hebrew title, the thank offering, is how that is translated um, it, from Hebrew. The Hebrew word todah means thank offering. So it really it should be a thank offering, uh, a response of the people for God, what God has done. It is the Revised Standard, New American Standard, and even King James that um, took those two words and put them together to be a thanksgiving, which is more of how we think of what we're doing. Although too often I think for us thanksgiving becomes a, a common usage word because of perhaps our thanksgiving celebration and our holidays. Um, and, and we can gloss over or forget that this is an act that we do, an offering of who we are in thankfulness to what God has done. Uh, the New Jerusalem version of the Bible uh, translates this as a psalm for praise, inviting us to recognize and claim the words here, again, in a very strong sense of the action uh, of what's going on. And, and I'm going to talk about this in the movement and the outline, but there is an invitation of increasingness of, of closeness or an invitation to be near to God that uh, is the energy, is the motion that this psalm does. So in verses 1 and 2, when it says, Shout joyfully, serve the Lord, come before Him, there is within that in the, the sense of you can see people moving into the temple who would have been either coming from outside of it or on a journey to it who are singing and shouting and as they get in the, the level of the intimacy becomes greater and greater so that at first they're outside uh, uh, acclaiming or shouting proclaiming then they get to the gates um, and then finally they come into God's presence. So that's part of the movement that's taking place within this psalm that is paralleled also in the later verses, especially verses uh, 4 and in the latter half of verses 3, that, uh, a parallel to our intimacy with God, that we come into the gates and then the courts and then to know God um, uh, by name and to know God by God's faithfulness and His mercy. Um, the, 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 the psalm ends with, For the Lord is good, His loving kindness. That's that steadfast love, the hesed that we've talked about before, and His faithfulness to all generations. And, and that's the, the Hebrew word uh, enuma, uh, which is what we've, we talked about if you were here in worship on Sunday. The, the, the word that is attributed to Abraham for his faithfulness is enuma, is not a not a faithfulness of a scent of head knowledge, but it's an action word, action verb, that because Abram moved out, and picked up his tents and so forth, he was faithful. Well, this is the, the, act, the, the same thing we're recognizing, claiming for God, that, that God's love is seen in his actions, his faithfulness to all the generations. Also then, within this, these verbs, this is the understanding of worship as action and as activity. Um, the, the Hebrew translate, the, the coming to the Lord to worship is the serve, is the word, the translated uh, root of this, which is an, um, uh, that, that our worship is an action that we do. Um, because 
the actual word means to serve. And again, in our English kind of sense, uh, there's a generalization of what we've made with these words of worship. Um, it, I rem I'm reminded when my Episcopal friend years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago now, shared with me that, that worship should be is better understood in the old English term as a service of worship. It's something that we are doing, participating, and acting all of who we are. So there's a physical reality to serving. As we serve to work, we serve to worship. There is a mental, there is a heart. Uh, we join our voices. We are working at serving uh, versus a passive quality that oftentimes uh, our word worship connotes that uh, or that uh, even now more culturally worship is, has taken on to the idea of the musical uh, context of when we gather as opposed to all that we offering. That's not wrong. That at least preserves that sense of the work of, of what we're doing because we are joining our voices and working at singing and praising and proclaiming but it lessens some of the other, which is an, also an act, a volitional act and a physical act to what we do. Uh, so with that in mind, as I said, this is very short. It's five verses. Uh, the easy way to see that is that there's uh, a parallels throughout all this. And so in verses one and two, you have this uh, threefold invitation to shout, to worship, to come. And then in verse three, you have the parallel or the contrast of that that's a threefold affirmation of why we do this because it is God who made us and we are His. And then again, it goes back in verse 4 that we have this threefold invitation as we move into the actual worship venue, uh, in this case the temple, to enter, to give thanks, and then to praise, that then is balanced with the threefold affirmation of why we do this because of God's nature, of his goodness, his love, and his faithfulness. There's another, uh, in my studies, worked on another kind of outline that I really like that I'm going to go ahead and share as well, that uh, the idea in verses 1 and 2 that, that God is the song, and so we are the singers participating in the song. And then in verse 3, God is the creator, and we are the creation. So you can see this kind of back and forth and balance. And then in verse 3, God is the shepherd, we are the sheep. And then in verse 4, God is the blessed one. We are the ones who receive the blessing. And then in verse 5, God is love. We are God's loved ones. And I love the balance that that offers and the invitation as I'm singing or saying this of this movement of God into us. And so the, the, the movement that I'm kind of highlighting there, this back and forth, this uh, act of what we offer and this do, I think for me, it invites us as we read it to ask the question, why are we worshiping God? Or why do we give God a service of our worship of, of who we are? And it comes down in there because of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, and God's loving kindness or his mercy. It is the activity of God that invites us in response. And, and I'm struck with how many of the psalms that I keep coming back to for myself, and then I'm obviously bringing them to you, uh, are inviting us to recognize who we are in response to what who God is by what God does for us and the actions of God. And so why do we worship? Because God has loved us. How do we know that God has loved us? He's redeemed us. He's, he's uh, uh, made us or moved us, called us to be a people. Um, that we worship God because of his steadfastness. He doesn't leave us even when we stray and walk away. He, he invites or calls us or chastens us to come back. And, and uh, the faithfulness of God and all that does not give up is a, a great reason why we should praise and proclaim and acclaim and sing. Um, and as I do also, uh, part of the work is sharing with you some of the interesting things and, and a reminder that translations uh, from uh, original texts are difficult in the sense that choices have to be made. And so as I, I started at the beginning and, and lifted up that verse 3, there are some issues that translators have had to work with because in the Hebrew, uh, it makes use of a word that can, in... in uh, one way of reading can mean his, and in another can mean uh, not or no. 
Um, and it has to do with how the vowel is pronounced. And, and the big complication is that in our oldest, I keep saying Masoretic texts, which are the oldest texts we have of Hebrew, there are no vowels. They went back later and put in what's called vowel pointings to help us translate or to spe uh, sh speak the word correctly. And in that translation, this word is kind of lost. We, it, we know it can be this and or this, depending on how it's pronounced. And so in the, the New American Standard, which again, as I've shared before, I like to read because it, it takes a very strong parallel to the original language, that verse 3, it is God who makes us and not we ourselves. And in the, uh, some of the more new, um, newer translations, uh, it takes that not out and replaces it with the, the understanding of we are his creation or we are made by him. Um, it, you know, so it's just one of those things just to let you know because it, it can affect how you interpret or understand the reading. Because uh, if God made us, this is not then talking about the sense of creation. This is talking about God calling or creating a nation, a, a people. And, and for those original hearers, would have been the understanding of they have been created out of or called to be a people out of Egypt. God choosing them to be his own people who belong to him. And so it, it emphasizes the relational quality of God's work with them. But other translations will highlight instead the creative power of God that we have been made in God's image. It, it's going to be interesting for you to look at your own translation and see, especially in verse 3, how does that? So again, in my New American Standard, it says, It is he who made us and not we ourselves. I mean, that's the creative kind of sense. Um, and in Eugene Peterson says, know this, God is God and God, God, he made us. We didn't make him. And again, it's stressing that creative as opposed to the, the calling of a people. So uh, that's there for you to, to think about, reflect on. Um, but as I, I want to sum up today, the idea is, or final thoughts, and then invite you to stay around and that at my closing is going to be the use of the old hundred, the hymn, and, and the tune that we're all familiar with, especially if you sing the doxology regularly, uh, to use the music as a means also to invite you into uh, uh, this psalm and, in, and its experience, in that that is ultimately why I do what I'm trying to do, and that's the invitation into experiential relationship with God through God's word here, specifically the psalm. So the, the, the final kind of thoughts that I'm going to throw out today is that um, true worship perhaps begins and is centered in and can only come from a recognition of who God is. And I said that over and over, but, but even this psalm specifically is coming to that point. Why do we worship? And so it involves recognizing God's creation, God's sovereignty, God's redemption, God's love and God's mercy. All of that and more are the worthiness of why we worship or why we trust God. Um, and, and, and then wrapped up in that then is the idea that God is not a, just a creator or a ruler, but God has, is beyond or more. He's a founder and a guardian, a shepherd uh, that uh, invites into a relationship with. And so there's not a stand back or a begin and, and leave, but it's a continuation of an acting of love that has invited us into this, that invites for us a serving in worship, a publicizing or a public gathering for us that is loud and exuberant uh, and proclaims uh, because uh, our adoration is so great recognizing that, but it's also as we've seen in the other Psalms, especially in this section, 96, 98, 99, uh, that as we do that in a, in a, in a, in a loud, joyful, boisterous, uh, expected way, others will hear 
and also perhaps see and experience God in new ways to adore uh, God for who God is and then to become united with uh, God's people. And my final thought then today also, this is a psalm that invites us into unity one another uh, because we are the created ones or the called ones, um, which is so important, especially in light of, at least for us in the United States, in our uh, conflict, social conflict, spiritual conflict, but it's seen most in our political conflict, but also in, in our cultural reality. This is calling us to be unified in our recognition of who we are and loving God. That's enough for today. Um, I'm not going to close in prayer, but you're going to see that I'm going to add, uh, once I stop, I will put the music in the words and invite that to be your closing prayer today. May God bless you in your serving in worship of God. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.